You know, it was so refreshing to see Pastor Mark's humility when he came up here and got that card, you know, just, <laughs> just, just so much humility when he... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I appreciate uh, Peter and Janine, just the worship. They've led us into the throne room of God these last couple of days, and I appreciate you guys so much for doing that. It's incredible. Thank you. I'm going to be in um, uh, Matthew chapter 6 and Luke 16, and I'm going to jump over, mark these, Chronicles chapter 29. So Matthew 6, Luke 16, Chronicles chapter 29. I'm going to do something different. And, you know, our title is, of course, you know, uh, Love Never Fails. And, I, and we kind of attach that to our love with each other on the horizontal, I mean, yeah, the horizontal. But how about the vertical and this unconditional love that we can have towards God? And there's one thing that gets in the way of that more than anything else, and even as, as Steve brought it up again, keeps us from making that place where we get closer to God. We get, it affects us getting closer to each other because it affects us getting closer to God. And it's one of the three main things that couples fight about. They fight about sex, they fight about finances, and they fight about the in-laws. Those are the three main fights that they have. So I want to cover one of those, the one of the main fights that they have, and I think it's, and it's one that I believe is connected directly, and I'm going to show you that today, connecting our relationship with God. It's not sex. It's finances. It's finances. It's an important area. And you know, the thing is, so many times when we hear a teaching on finances in the church, it's always almost bent, isn't it? Always on giving. As if God is only concerned with your giving. You know, but what many ministers and pastors fail to bring out from the Bible is that God is concerned with your saving. God is concerned with your spending. God's concerned with your debt, just as much as he's concerned with your giving in that area. But instead of taking a lopsided view of finances with only the giving, let's look at the different areas. And look at this, the finances, that God... The word speaks on, and in the way, we can get a healthy view and understanding of God's desire to bring great blessing, of not only finances, but towards him too, in an incredible way. So, the important word I want to bring out is really balance. Uh, balance is the key. When you're looking at all those areas, there has to be balance. You don't want to be lopsided in any area. You want to have balance in all those areas. Balance, the definition, is a condition uh, in which different elements are equal or in correct proportion to themselves. That's what we are supposed to do. And I think you would agree that success in life comes by maintaining balance, especially with the things that matter the most to us, like our family, like our marriage, like our kids, diet, nutrition, exercise. Those things are important to many, many people. If our kids had their way, they would not have balance. It'd be all sugary foods, it'd be all sugary drinks, video games, along with french fries and pizza all the time. And for us as adults, we want a healthy balance between family and work, friends and work. We want that healthy balance. Yet at times when we're left to our own choices, without any guidance, we are either bent either to be too career-oriented, and then the family suffers. Or we end up not holding a marriage together, and so our family is, you know, orient our job, our career suffers because of that. And so we find out those kinds of things happen. And then we just seem to, we can't seem to hold a job down very long because I'm so family oriented. I just can't hold a job down. And next thing you know, our, we're suffering financially. We're arguing about finances because, you know, and then you're so career oriented that your family suffers. And you no, know, there's got to be balance, right? Life is balance. And there has to be that kind of balance in life. So how do you balance Practically, I want to give you something very practical in our last session together today. You know, with our kids, health, and your balancing act with family, friends, and work, and God, you always have to have, listen, three things you have to have. You have to have a reference point, number one. You need to have a reference point. Number two, you need to have, make adjustments. And if you make adjustments, then you have doable goals that you will reach. So there's a reference point, there's adjustments, 
And then there's doable goals. It's part of the whole sphere of balance in that kind of area. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Let's say it's your personal health. You're trying to get healthier. You're trying to lose weight and exercise. You need a reference point. So your reference point, if that's what you want, may be to join Weight Watchers. That's going to be your reference point. Or maybe to get a gym membership. It'll be your reference point because that's what you want to do. And so that's what you want to try to maintain. And so you begin to do that. And so what ends up happening is that you need to make adjustments once you do that. Because you join Jenny Craig, and you know, I hate Jenny Craig. All right, make an adjustment. Try Weight Watchers. You know, or Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig, whatever the case may be. And then you go, okay, I was going to go to the gym Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This is not working. We'll make some adjustments. Go Monday and Friday. We'll go Thursday and Tuesday and Thursday. We'll go just on Wednesday. Or go just once a year. Whatever the adjustments you need to make is, <laughs> make them. Because now you're making it, what's our third one? Doable. Do you, you understand? You've got to make it doable. You don't want to quit. You just want to make sure that you're going to make this doable in what your goal is. And so you get your reference point, you make it adjust, make adjustments, and you make it everything very doable. You don't quit. And this is, you know, is all of the same with our finances too, folks. Same way. We do it that way. Listen, just as a personal testimony for myself, I grew up with no financial guidance from my parents whatsoever. None at all. I mean, I, I, nothing on savings, nothing on giving, nothing on debt, nothing on spending, and neither did my wife, Debbie. She got zero, too, at that. So we're coming in together learning the hard way as we're coming into this area. It took us a while, and of course, it was through failure that we learned most everything, don't we? And we did. And we went from, you know, from first married, we're in college together, you know, we're having nothing. We're living off Social Security. Uh, my dad, who died when I was young, and her mother died uh, also. And so we had getting these Social Security checks as long as we stayed in school. So we're living off of that. I had a part-time job in college. So we struggled through our college financially. You know, we didn't take out any student loans. That was the only smart thing we did in college. And, but once upon graduation, our Social Security checks stopped. So we moved back to Oklahoma City, and we decided to live with her dad, and we decided that we're going to save money. First time that word ever came up in our marriage. We're going to save some money now. And so we both take full-time jobs, you know, and so we're going to, you know, we're going to save some money. And so uh, we wanted to do that because we wanted to go back to Las Vegas and work because, you know, it was where we ended up. We used to go there in the summer times and work when I was going to school, you know, go to Las Vegas, deal blackjack for the summer, come back, save my money, go to school, I'll pay my way through school that way, and so now that I've graduated, it's like, that's the only place I'm going to make money, so let's, let's save up so we can get back out to Las Vegas, and so we decided to live with her dad and save some money, so we moved in with him, we both had full-time jobs, and we didn't pay any rent, we didn't pay any utilities, we didn't pay for anything, so we could save money, two full-time jobs, not doing anything at all, and so that's what we learned, so we managed to save in six months, between the two full-time workers, $300. <laughs> we did not do well at this. <laughs> Terrible at this. I just like, you know, I mean, you know we, were, I, we were spending money, I guess. Uh, obviously, we didn't do well with our first venture in saving. We were doing a lot of spending. And, and, you know, it, was, and it wasn't on weed. Weed back then, you get a four-finger bag for 10 bucks, you know, so it wasn't that bad of, in that kind of area. We weren't blowing it off in smoke because we weren't saved at that time. But, you know, we were spending our money in other areas completely. And then, then what happened? We, go to, we get to Las Vegas, and we are making more money than we've ever made before in our lives. A whole different change that happened. So we had no balance. I mean, we paid for everything in cash. We paid for our furniture in cash. We paid for our cars in cash at that time. And we didn't need balance because we had so much money. We saved a little, and only the giving that we did was tip in restaurants. That was our only giving that we ever did at all. And then we get saved, and Jesus becomes into our life. And God's Spirit, you know, rests, you know, upon our hearts at that time, and he really put upon our hearts, and both of us at the same time, we need to give to the Lord. And we just looked to the Bible, what do you, how am I supposed to give? You know, we saw 10%, so go, that's what we'll do, we'll give 10%. So that was the first time we had actually figured out, you know, uh, what we're going to give to the Lord. And so once our convictions were there, you know, to give that. So the first thing we had to do to give 10%, we had to really figure out what we really made. Because we didn't know what we made. 
Now, you think, well, you get a W-2 every year. Yeah, but that's only with the casino. We, make, we live mostly off of our tips, and no one declared their tips to the IRS then. And that's where our biggest money was. So we go, well, let's figure out what we really make now. And so we sat down, and we figured this out, what we really make. And when we found out, we saw what 10% of that was, our eyes got as big as saucers. I mean, we go, whoa, that's like a mortgage payment. That's a car payment, two car payments. Whoa. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, now, but the, the, here's the thing is, now we're tracking our finances, which was the best thing that could have ever happened to us. Money wasn't an issue in that casino. We had plenty, we made plenty, but tracking it put us on the road now to have some balance into our lives. Then I went from the casinos into the ministry. A huge, huge cut in salary <laughs> compared to what I was making. Now we really had to track our finances. You know what I mean? I had to really track them down. The church paid all of my housing uh, costs and all those kinds of things. Uh, and the senior pastor told us that we don't need to worry about tithing. It's already been accounted for what he said in our housing. Uh, I didn't ask what that meant. I just trusted that it was the right thing to do. And for three years when I was on staff there, we didn't tithe. We didn't give anything. And because it was already accounted for in our housing allowance. And what was interesting, in those three years, what we had saved in savings was now dwindling away. We were draining our savings account completely. We were off balance. We were off balance. And it was so much easier when you're making money to manage money, but now, you know, you're not making a whole lot of money, and at the same time, not tithing or giving, and our savings is absolutely dwindling. And we realize it doesn't matter if you're making a lot or little balance, it still has to be present. Then we leave there and come out to Tallahassee to start the church. Another huge cut in income. No income. That's a pretty big cut, right? No income now. And for the first time in three years, but we both got full-time jobs when we were starting the church there, we could actually tithe again. And that was the greatest joy. It was, one of, it was at that time that we realized that we were really robbed of the joy of actually giving for those three years. And at the same time, we were able to maintain. Listen, even though Debbie and I were working at minimum wage jobs, this is in 86, I was working at a place called HQ in the paint department making $4.50 an hour. My wife was working at Stanley Steamer making about the same amount of money an hour. We had a six-year-old and a three-year-old at that time. The church in Las Vegas, Spring Valley, we were their first mission outreach, so they would send us $300 a month because they figured that we were in a third-world city, <laughs> Tallahassee. You know, we're in the south, so they figured that's what they might as well help them out. And so they did. And, uh, and so, we, you know, but that, that's, that's all we had. It was, we had no one to really help us out to learn the hard way about balance. But we found ourselves balancing with almost nothing at all. There was a balance there with everything. But it prepared me for, you know, to put into practice the same principles when it came to the church and the church's income too, where the church has never been in a position of imbalance. 30 years, never been in that position along the way. So you, you have to make adjustments. You make it just make everything doable. So that's kind of my testimony in our life and when it came to our finances. But those reference points, those adjustments, those doable goals, it's tricky when it comes to financial balance. I mean, I will make immediate adjustments if my doctor says my cholesterol is too high and my blood pressure is through the roof. Immediate adjustments. I make immediate adjustments to my diet. You know, I will take whatever pills he tells me to take religiously. But in the realm of personal finances, this principle of immediacy actually does not apply. For when we are off balance financially, we don't have the immediacy like we do with cancer or with bad cholesterol or high blood pressure. And when finances are like, you know, and when fi you know, with finances, we're kind of like the frog in the pan of water. You don't really know it's heating up, you know, to jump out. It just kind of is what happened kind of thing is what it ends up being. And there is no immediacy to adjust because financial balance follows a different principle. It's a principle in the Bible. It's called the principle of the harvest. A person reaps what he sows. 
And it would be great if we got unbalanced with finances like our health. When the doctor says, you keep eating like that, you're a dead man walking. You know, but then we would get balanced again quickly, but we don't because we're under a different principle from the Bible. You reap what you sow. And for me personally, I don't like that, but it's true. You know, healthy decisions in the past and the present will reap positive results for the future. That's what we live by in the principles of reaping and sowing. So it's no surprise unhealthy financial decisions reap negative results. It does it every time. So people who abuse credit cards during their college years or early 20 years, they're paying for that for a long period of time. And many of them are still struggling with the consequences of those kinds of decisions. So we're not always aware of it that our financial decisions often affect our areas of our lives. Now money, good or bad, you know, influences our relationship with God. And that's what I want to drive this to. It influences our relationship with our families and our friends. No matter what the Bible has so much to say about money. You know, the Bible has more to say about money than it does heaven and hell. A lot more. And I mean, it's, it's incredible than anything else. The Bible suggests that you can't be upside down in your finances and actually be in harmony with God. In other words, you can't be a committed follower of Jesus Christ and remain irresponsible with your money. That's God's perspective. That's not mine. That's his perspective in the scriptures. And I know what you're th probably thinking, <laughs> because I would think the same thing many times is this. Isn't, Pastor Kent, isn't God more interested in spiritual things? And let me say, you're absolutely correct. He is much more interested in spiritual things. But did you know that money is a spiritual thing? Did you know that? I mean, I know that you would agree that the Bible addresses some of the most important issues about our lives. Relationships I've been talking about, love, absolutely, family, trust, faith. Why? Because each one of those are issues of the heart. They're issues of the heart. But did you know, just like those, money is also an issue of the heart too. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 19, if you would please. Matthew 6, verse 19 what it says here, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we all admit it's a no-brainer that our family is a treasure to us. We know our hearts there with our family. The relations we develop is a treasure to every single one of us. Those we know are hard issues, right? Very much hard issues. But the context in Jesus talking about here, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, is not speaking about our families, not speaking about our kids, not speaking about our spouses. The context of treasure is speaking of our finances, speaking of money. That's the whole context. That's why I read it in context. So you'd see that. So let us know that this is absolutely a hard issue. And I want to know from God's word how I can be a better husband to my wife. We've been talking about that. I want to know what the Bible says about me being a better father to my kids. We want to know what the Bible says about that. And I, want to, and I desire to do that. I, ha, I have such a desire to obey those things so I can be better at what I'm doing. But God has purpose for me to be a successful husband or father. Now, wouldn't we want the same thing with our finances? To follow what God says about finances that will make us not only successful with God, but successful in life itself. Do we have the same desire for issues of the heart with those people we love when it comes to finances? Now listen, whether we admit it or not, all of us, including myself, everybody, there's a, there's a various degrees of a love towards money. We all have that. So faith and finances go together. And I want you to understand that faith and finances absolutely go together. It's a natural principle, like gravity. You know if you jump off a building, you're not going to float. You're going to come right down, pull you down. You know the very principle. It's a natural principle. You know that fire, if you put your hand into a fire, you know what's going to happen. You've got to burn each and every time. It's a natural principle. We have no problem with natural principles. So we accept it, and because of that, we don't jump off buildings, and we don't put our hands in the fire. The same is true with the heart and money. And you, know, you want to know where your heart is, it's really easy. All you got to do is look in your checkbook and look at your ledger. 
All you gotta do is look at your credit card statement. You'll find out exactly where it is. It's an easy thing to find. Now, listen. Does God want your checkbook or credit card? No. Does God want your heart? Yes. Yes, he does. Look at Luke chapter 16. Look at verse 13. If you turn over to Luke real quick. Luke 16, 13. Jesus speaking again. And these are all Jesus' words speaking here that I'm reading to you. He's saying, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And another word for mammon is finances, is money. And so Jesus is saying, listen, the number one competitor for your allegiance to God is money. Number one. Or material possessions, whatever what it is you want to call it. So you know it's your stuff. Number one competitor for allegiance. So here we are, the triangle. Here you are trying to get close to God, and this is getting in the way. This is the one that's coming, and now you two are getting as close together as you would want to because there's something in the way there. The number one competitor, Jesus is saying, for your allegiance to God is money. And this is a conflict you and I face every day. Are we going to serve our stuff, or are we going to serve God? And that is why Jesus talks so much about money. He knew that our approach to finances revealed something about our relationship with God. This isn't just Jesus. It's addressed all through the Bible, you guys. But listen, let me just say this is not to make you feel guilty, please. So you give more to your church or some organization. No, no, listen. Jesus doesn't need your money. He is not trying to get your money. Please understand that. He just wants to make sure that my money doesn't get me. That's all he's trying to do. That's what he's trying to make sure of. It's not getting me. As Debbie and I discovered, you know, our first step was tracking our money, tracking our spending, tracking our savings, tracking our debt, tracking our giving. Let's just, let's just keep track of all this. We're tracking those kinds of things. And that's what we call the reference points. And once you see where and how much you spend or how much you save, that's when you see if there's an imbalance so that you can make, I need to make some adjustments. So I make this a doable thing that I'm actually going to be able to do. It's that simple. And if you will just practically do that, and please understand, finances is just as spiritual as love again. This is as, as relationships, as family, as trust, as faith, as prayer, as the word, just as spiritual. For those are issues of the heart. And as Jesus said, so are our finances, issues of the heart. Now, you might sit back and you tithe, you save. There's no debt that you, that's not manageable for you. You might be a person who has profited in business ventures. You have always done well with your family, your finances. Rarely, if at all, never experienced financial hardships. Yet when Jesus says you cannot serve two masters, God and money, have you wondered about your allegiance? Though? That's a good question. I mean, are you serving God and seeing your finances through God's perspective? Or is your allegiance to money about, well, I have the ability to give generously, just merely a byproduct of being financially successful, and so I just definitely do that. And listen, I say all that because you have to understand who Jesus was addressing here when he said you can't serve both God and mammon. He's addressing the Pharisees. He's addressing a very rich group that were financially stable who were givers, who gave. He talks about them giving. They made a show of it, but they still were givers. And so they fasted, they gave, and Jesus knew that you could appear to be making all the right moves with regard to faith and finances. But if the heart were not loyal to God, then you're still a slave to money, regardless of your perceived generosity. You know, a good example of that is the rich young ruler. Remember that guy? Came to Jesus. What did he say? He goes, Master, what can I do? Good teacher, what can I do? Well, you do, he goes, I've done this. I've kept all the commandments. as a young boy. He was a generous man. He's a man who thought, what else can I do? I want to do more. And Jesus looked inside the heart, and he saw in the heart, even though he was generous, that he had a problem with money. So it's possible to have a sound financial principles, a generous lifestyle, yet still money, serving money as a master, I can still be there. That's why Jesus went on to say this of the Pharisees. Look at verse 15 
of, the, of Luke 16. He goes on to say, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed amongst men is an abomination in the sight of God. I mean, Jesus was nailing this. But it's an important area that needed to be now. So to be financially balanced, is it about having a balanced checkbook? It's first and foremost about whom our hearts are serving, number one. And unfortunately, there is no machine that we can hook up to in our hearts to gauge whether we're serving God or money. I wish there was, but there's not. Instead, this requires a little bit of soul searching, honest assessment, assessment accountability. That's something a husband and wife can do together with each other. And I think it's a wonderful thing for them to be able to do that together. So there's only one thing that really drives our personal finances to be in the right perspective. There's only one word that puts this all into perspective and having a right heart. And that's what we all want. I want one. That is the one word that has helped me to keep a general, healthy perspective of personal finances. And that one word, I'm sure you've heard this before, is called steward. Ship. It's called stewardship. And that's a, that's a very interesting word because it's used quite a bit by Jesus and in the Bible. But let me just tell you, it, it's, it's a, it's a, you see a steward by definition is a person who's been entrusted with someone else's resources. That's what a steward is. We often entrust our financial investors with money managers. Same thing. It's the same kind of thing. The principle is the same. The goal of the steward, listen, the goal of the steward is to grow the owner's assets, not for personal profit of the money manager, but for the benefit of the owner himself. So when we begin to view ourselves as stewards of someone else's resources, then you can't help but view money and possessions as it's all God's. It's all his. I'm just the money manager of my Lord's resources. That's all I am. And once we grip that, the heart issue begins to be aligned more rightly. The lenses that we're looking through on how we spend, save, give, and manage debt, it's a game changer once we really understand who we are in this area. For we are, for we are thinking about honoring God through all of this, of being a steward. This is his. I'm just managing it. Some people always think, well, once I give the 10% and the other 90% or well, however percent you give, the other 90% is mine. I can do whatever I want with it. No, 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 no. You're a steward. That's why there's a balance of all those things everywhere. And that's what a steward does. He balances those types of things. You know, David, King David, the great king, saw himself as a steward. I mean, in the Old Testament, David was eager to build God a temple. You may remember that. You know, you can see up until that time, God's been residing into a tent, to a tabernacle. And David had this strong desire. I want to build God a house. I want to give him a temple. Now, of course, in Israel, was settling into the promised land, and David had brought the peace to the land at this time, and through years of David warring to the greatest king that Israel had ever had, never lost a battle on the battlefield. He had subdued all of his enemies. He had alliances with so many people, so many connections with everybody. Everybody owed him, you know? And now he's going, there's kind of peace in the land. I'm going to cash in on this, some of these guys. But what happened was, is that he wanted to do this temple in times of peace for God. And it was times of peace. But God decided, no, no, no. That task would not be David for you. David, you're a man of war. You've got bloody hands. You're not going to build my house. It's not going to be you. I want a man who's raised up in peace. It's going to be your son Solomon that's going to do it. You can't be the guy. So David couldn't build it. But David, but God didn't say he couldn't raise the capital for it. And that's what he did. And so thus David raised the capital and gathered up all the materials, all the resources, cashed in all of his connections. Everybody owed him. He had him come through with him, and, man, he gathered it all in. Then as David started to pray with everyone assembled in anticipation of this great temple that they're going to be able to build, we discover his ultimate goal not only for his finances but also for his life. First Chronicles, you got there? Chapter 29. Here's David. Addressing the folks and what he's saying here. Chapter 29, look at verse 10. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said this. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. 
Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people? That we should be able to offer so willingly as this. For all things come from you. And of your own, we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you. As were all your fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow. And without hope. Notice David saw himself right here in life with God. Everything in life was all about God for him. Every single thing. I mean, nothing, nothing else mattered with him. He believed everything belonged to God and everything came from God. And listen, it would have been easy for David to believe otherwise. He could be one of those guys saying, listen, I've, I've worked hard. I put my hand in this. I've been out there sweating out there. I'm a hard worker. I'm a productive person. I'm a talented soldier. I'm a great musician. I'm productive. And he had all the touch. It was his personality that could have de that developed all these things and made this such a great king. He could have easily said, I'm the man. I'm a self-made man. And under David's superb leadership, he had conquered dangerous enemies and led Israel through fierce battles. Because of David, Israel became this incredible name. Yet David knew, and he says it, that everything came from God. Everything. All the glory and all the riches, all the accolades, all the victories, all the talents, all the skills, all the connections, all of it came from God. Look at verse 14 again, where he says, But who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to offer so willingly as this, for all things come from you. And of your own, <laughs> we're just giving you of your own. It's yours anyway. You know, that's what he's saying, just giving it back to you. So David saw himself in life as being a steward, a person entrusted with someone else's resources. And so given that, everything from God, David's one goal in life was to honor God. That was his one goal. I mean, what was his objective as a shepherd boy to honor God? What was his objective as the king of Israel to honor God? What was his objective with his finances? We just read it. To honor God. Everything. To honor God. The one thing that drives our personal finances should be to live with our hands open before God, believing that we should honor him with everything that we have. And since everything we have comes from him in the first place, that is what a man, after God's own heart, believed in. He actually practiced himself. And what it would have been so easy for David to believe that he was this self-made man. Look at all I've accomplished. Look at all I'm successful. I'm the one who brought all this. I'm the one who made myself rich. I worked hard. I'm smart. I read Tony Robbins' books and listened to his CDs. You know, I did all that. You know, it could be easy for him to really believe in himself. But if he would be, and listen, if we would be like David, that would mean that we're choosing to live with the mentality, God's instead of mine. I mean, that's just, that's, that's what would happen. You're choosing to believe that all your talent, all your gifts, all your skills, ultimately just came from the Lord. He blessed you with all that. And you're choosing to allow your personal finances to be driven with one thing in mind. I want to honor God no matter what he says. I want to honor God in the way I save. I want to honor God in the way I, I handle debt. I want to honor God in the way I spend. I want to honor God in the way I give. I want to honor God in all, how I do all those things. But what is hard and what we have to overcome is the difference in stewardship and ownership. There's a big difference because it's hard to see ourselves as stewards because we're so drawn to ourselves that I, I'm the owner of this. But the reality is we really don't own anything we have. That's the reality. It's all a blessing of God's, but the blessing is not to own. The blessing is for us to be able to, he's letting us manage his stuff. What a blessing that is. So how do we do this? You always have to start with prayer. Number one. You've got to always start, start with prayer. God, show me how to honor you with everything I have, for it's all yours anyway, and that's the first place you always start, just praying together in that area. Are we aware of what God has loaned us? You know, when someone loans us something, we always have a tendency to take good care of it, right? Some friend of yours loans you his tools or something, I'm going to take good care of that. How much more we should take care of what he has given us in savings and spending and giving and, and being debt-free. There should be one thing that drives our personal finances. It's stewardship, not ownership. And once we can get that mentality, I think it's a good place for us to be. But let's say, let's say the first thing a Christian needs to get into balance and in being generous, and I use this because this is the one 
that is always the one that, you know, people always have off balance. Because, you know, I don't know about you, I got spending down to a science. I know how to spend. I know how to get in debt. There's not a problem there. You know, I can save a little bit too, but the biggest area is the, actually the giving. That's the one that's really, really off balance in many respects with many different people. And so, but are you not, you know, see, this is the thing. Let's just say the first thing a Christian needs to get in balance is being generous. But you are not sure what that means. What does that mean? And what does it mean? I mean, you know, it means, yes, you thought about your church you attend to. You thought about other charities that you felt drawn to. Maybe you're supporting children in a foreign country, those kinds of things. But let's just say you hear a message on tithing, giving 10%. Then you wonder, okay, how much should we be giving to the church that we're attending? You know, you have this desire to honor God with your finances, but not sure what percentage to give to each of these other causes that you're drawn to also. So the question is asked, is giving to the church supposed to be my first priority, or does it matter how we appropriate our giving? Those are great questions. And I get people asking that all the time. and Because they want to know, I want to give, but I want to know how this works. How do I do this kind of thing? And those are honest questions people ask when they are wanting to honor God and being generous. So how much should I regularly give to God? We realize that God owns everything that we have. Are we as stewards commanded to give according to the needs that we see around us? Or are we commanded to honor God to give a consistent percentage on a regular basis? What do we do? Because we know those things. Listen, it's in the Old Testament that tithing is actually mentioned. And let me just tell you what it says just kind of give a recap what that meant with them. It was, it was an Old Testament thing in the Old Testament to tithe. It was a means of honoring God with their finances, all it was. So Israel was commanded to bring in the best 10% of their finances or harvest, whatever it may be, to God. That's in Leviticus 27.30. This practice of tithing trained the Israelites to remember who was first in their lives. That's what it was all about. Just a training to know who's first in your lives. And realizing that God provided the entire 100%, thus the first 10% was given to him. That was just the beginning. For there were various other offerings and charitable giving on top of that. If you look through the scriptures, it's pretty close to 26 to 32% that they gave. It wasn't 10%. That was just their starting point. It just went over and beyond that with them in many, in many areas. So there was no denying that all that they had come from God, and they understood that. And as a result, giving was ingrained in the relationship with God. And when they did not give appropriately, their faith suffered. Why? Because as we've already discovered, faith and finances are intertwined. It's a hard issue. And thus the tithe was just the beginning point for their giving, not some budgeted item that they checked off in order to be right before God. That was the Old Testament. That's what they did in the Old Testament. For us today in the New Testament, the tithe has been replaced by a greater command to practice generosity at all times. Now, that's a very debatable subject because, you know, tithing was in the Old Testament, but tithing actually preceded the Bible, preceded the uh, Old Testament. It was back in Genesis when Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek. So it preceded that. So many people believe it just goes right into the New Testament, but the New Testament doesn't really mention it, and that's just a debating thing that's out there. But, the, but the, the thing that the greater command to practice generosity at all times was given to us in the scriptures, and it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and it says this in verse 6, it says, and being ready, oh, excuse me, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. For Jesus, listen, for Jesus and his followers who grew up with this practice of tithing, giving to God meant so much more than just 10% of offerings. I mean, yet there is no exact amount or percentage that is commanded in the New Testament that we are to give. Nothing. Now, for Debbie and I, and I should share this with you, Debbie and I, this is what, we had the conviction, we want, we want to give 10% right off the top to God. And that helps us to have a starting point with the consistency with every paycheck, and then if we want to go beyond that with other things, we can go beyond that and give according to how the New Testament tells us to give. 
And so, we, so, you know, that's what we will do. Other things come up, we're drawn to, hey, we want to give to that. So to live in that realm of the New Testament, of a greater command to practice generosity as other things arise that we feel drawn to. So that's what we have done. That's how we've understood that to be for us personally. That's not going to be the same for everybody. Okay, but that's what's just for us. But listen, like anything in life, becoming more generous requires a level of discipline. We don't become generous overnight. Nobody does. And like anything in life that is hard to do, especially when it comes to practices in our life, to train ourselves to be more open-handed and charitable with our finance, because that's the one area that we've we we got a lot of imbalance in with those things. I wish I had time to talk to you about savings and debt and getting out of debt and all that kind of stuff. I don't have the time to do all that because it, that's an important area because you want to have a savings because when you have a savings and you're actually putting money away, when well, you have those emergency things that happen with a car, a house, an air conditioning, you got money instead of having to go into debt and borrow. That's how important you want to have a balance of savings in there because that's what happens to us when we have those emergencies happen. What happens? We don't have a savings. So what do we do? We've got to go in debt. We've got to go in and we don't. So you always want to have emergency funds, savings, put aside for that. I, like I said, I wish we had more time to develop that, but there, there's a balance with that, you guys. Bring it all in. It's all going to be there for you, and it's going to help you to grow in your relationship with God. So tithing or regular giving or whatever you would like to call it trains us to put God first in regards to our finances. And if tithing is too great, but you want to have a starting point that is consistent with every paycheck, then pick a percentage. Just pick one. Remember, reference, pick a percentage. You want to make it doable. You want to make adjustments because you'll make it doable so that may happen. And I always tell people this. If you want to just start with 6%, start with 6%. See how that goes. See how that works for you and see how, how that takes. And then next year, maybe see you want to add another percentage. Make 7% or you just, you just want to see how you can do with it. But always make sure you got your reference point. You make adjustments if you need to so you, because you want to always make this doable. You don't want to stop or quit on it. And some people I talk to, they go, I can't give to, I just can't give 10% so they don't do anything at all. No, 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 don't do, don't do that. Pick something. God's going to honor that. But have something that you're doing in a reference point, and you're showing honor towards him. And so, couples, husbands, wives, your first assignment, if you haven't done it, track your income. Sit down and track how you're spending, how your savings, how your debt you know, and if you've if you got a lot of debt, how can we start to save and, and so we can start getting out of debt and how we can also throw giving in there too at the same time. And you start putting those balances together. Oh, my. You're going to find how, how you're honoring him and how he's going to bless you in your life. It's the balance. It's the balance of everything that we have because it's all his. And we're just the stewards of his resources that he's given each and every one of us. And so that's the end of that lesson. I could almost hear a pin drop the whole time I was doing this. You know? It's almost like giving a sex lesson, you know, today. You can, it's just really quiet. Finances and sex is a very quiet thing, you know, and, and those kinds of things. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm saving my money, so no, I... Uh, <laughs> No, I, I, the, the ring tattoo, my wife talked me into this. So, because I kept losing my wedding ring. And I'll tell you this story real quick. But I kept losing my wedding ring. And so she goes, let's go get tattoos. You know, we've been married 40 years. We're not going anywhere. Well, that's true. And so, uh, you know, it's like, so she talked me into it. And uh, so we went down there to, to uh, we did it together. And so it's just, just a ring tattoo. And, it, and it's great because, yeah, okay, well, that's right. <laughs> Thank you for throwing me under the bus again, honey. Yes, what happened was I thought I put my wedding ring on the, ba on the, ki on the bathroom uh, counter over there, and as I was, I was looking for it, I go, have you seen my wedding ring out here? And she goes, I didn't see any wedding ring. I go, I'm sure I left it in the bathroom. I'm sure I did. And I actually believe it so, bad, so much that I checked you know, the, the thing in the sink, see if it went down in the sink. I checked the little thing, and I checked both of them. I go, it's not here. And I go, well, she's, she's taking it and hitting it somewhere. She got taken away. She wants to go get this tattoo. And so it's like, I really thought she, and then we go and get the tattoo rings, and, uh, and, and then we get them, okay, fine. And then she's in the backyard with our grandson, and all of a sudden she saw something glistening over in the natural area. And there, on top of a little mound where a squirrel had been digging for something, was my wedding ring. It was underground, and the squirrel dug it up, and it's sitting on the very top. 
and she took pictures of it to make sure she sent it to me. I did not destroy your <laughs> ring, you know. <laughs> Send them all to me. So you know that's 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 the, that's the story of that that ring right there. So that that's my only my only tattoo that I that I have is that tattoo. And so, um, but yes, that's that's uh, yeah that's my story, and that's a great segue into communion now, I guess, huh? <laughs> But yeah, listen, at this time, we're going to take communion together, you guys. And this is really such a very special time to end, the, uh, you know, end this time together and just honoring the Lord you know, with his body and his blood. You know, it says in the Bible, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. That's the definition of faith. And just before that definition came up, where did that author, be it Paul, get that definition from? He got it from a few verses above where it says the just shall live by faith. Three times he used that in the New Testament. And then he gets his definition from the just shall live by faith by saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And this right here is the essence of our faith right here. This is the essence of it all. This is the substance of things hoped for. We're taking that bread, we're taking that cup, and that substance, and we're saying, this is what Jesus did for me. That has, that's got, it's tangible, it's substance. For us, it is like, it's rock solid. And that's what we do. When we take that bread, and we hold that bread into our hand, you know, we go, that was his body that was broken for me. By his stripes, we are healed. But also Jesus said in John 6, he said, you know, he said, I am the bread of life. And he compared himself to the manna, it was in the desert that was brought down from heaven. I've come down from heaven as the manna ran down from heaven, and he compared himself to that. Now, what did the manna do? It sustained life. And so as we take of the bread, we're taking of that, the substance that we have life sustained. We're going to live. We're going to live forever. And that is just rock solid. We take the juice, of course, which is his blood. And without the, without the spilling of blood, there's no remission of sins. That's our forgiveness. That's our, the bread's the life. There's the forgiveness and both those life with God now in total bliss and total happiness. And say, so that's the substance that we have that we're going to take of in the elements here. The evidence of things not seen. Now, what do we not see? We don't see that yet, do we? But the evidence is in the written word of God. He said, this is my body, take, remember me. This is my blood for the remission of your sins. That's the evidence of what we don't see. See, that's the totally essence of our faith is right there. When we take of the Lord's Supper, honoring him in this kind of way. And so as we, I was going to have the pastors and their wives, Steve, Rob, your wife, and, and uh, Mark, you guys come up here. I'm going to have them pass them out to you guys. And then we're just gonna, we'll just take it together, hold on to it. We'll just take it together as a, as a husband, as wife, as family, as the body of Christ. And let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we can just come before you and honor you. And right now, Lord, we don't, we don't want to think about anything else except our Savior, Jesus. We want to be focused upon him. What he did 2,000 years ago for each and every one of us. The breaking of his body, the spilling of his blood. The ushering in of the new covenant that we are so graciously under right now. We live in such a great time. And Lord, we're so thankful. We're so honored that you have saved us and you love us. And Lord, now as we remember you, we honor you. Lord, may you just inhabit this place right now. Inhabit the praises of your people, Lord, as we're getting ready to take communion together. So Lord, I thank you. Blessing upon you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.